the GI tract. The GI tract is composed of, you know, well, the GI tract in the abdomen is composed of the stomach, the small intestines, and the large intestines. And what we're going to do is focus on the stomach first. Now, the stomach has the following regions, the cardia, fundus, body, the gastric rugae internally, pylorus, and the omenta. So we'll start with the cardia. The cardia is the portion that is uh, adjacent to where the esophagus enters into the stomach. It has some specific cardiac glands that are there, but cardia because it's closest to the heart. Uh, we also have the fundus, and the fundus is any dome-shaped top of an organ. It's, there's other organs that have a fundal portion or a fundus portion, and the fundus is this uh, region that actually gas can accumulate inside this because gas rises up and it's the highest part where belches kind of come from. Then there's the body, which is the main portion of the stomach, and that has two parts. It has a lesser curvature, which is a curve in the body of the stomach that's smaller, and then a greater curvature, which is a curve that's a little bit um, bigger on the bottom of it. Uh, we also have internally, so if we were to now take a, uh, an imaginary scalpel and go shing and just cut open it, we take the front off in this coronal section, we look inside, we can see the these gastric rugae, these uh, ridges that help to expand the stomach uh, so the stomach can get bigger when we eat. And then the very terminal part of the stomach is called the pylorus. And the pylorus, um, uh, when we take a look at a, another section where there's the pylorus that's been cut, and then there's the duodenum, which is the next part of the small intestine. Right between, we have this thickening of, this, of the inner circular layer of the muscular muscularis externa, it's called the pyloric sphincter, and it contracts, and its purpose is to keep food from going from the duodenum back into the stomach. Uh, these two mesenteric structures, one's called the lesser omentum, and one is called the greater omentum. The lesser omentum is a... Uh, 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 it's a mesentery that arises from the lesser curvature of the stomach and then courses and attaches to the bottom of the liver. Um, a word that means liver is hepato. So if you think of hepatocytes, hepatitis, anything of that nature, it deals with liver. Now that's important because this lesser omentum really has two different components to it. There's the pylorus part of the stomach, which then goes, there's that little derivation where the pyloric sphincter is, and then the duodenum is next. And so this lesser omentum attaches to the duodenum and the stomach and goes to the liver. So anatomists love to name everything. So we figure, oh, there's that little separation. So we'll call that the hepatoduodenal ligament, which is a part of the lesser omentum. And then this is the hepatogastric ligament, hepato for liver, gastric for stomach. And these two different uh, ligaments are part of or aspects of the lesser omentum. Um, the lesser omentum also gives rise to this opening called the epiploic foramen, and the epiploic foramen goes into this portion deep to the lesser omentum called the lesser sac, and it's a blind-ended cul-de-sac deep to the lesser omentum and stomach. The greater omentum is arising from the greater curvature of the body of the stomach and then descends down to cover all the abdominal viscera. It's called the guardian of the abdomen because within all this omentum, which is connective tissue and a lot of adipose tissue, there are also numerous lymph nodes. And they have this really neat function of surrounding areas of infection or tumors. And these lymphatic, uh, this, some of this lymphatic tissue basically encompasses or encapsulates these areas of infection. So in doing abdominal surgery, often a surgeon will look to see what the greater omentum is doing as if it has migrated and surrounded a certain part of infection. It's pretty neat. So here we have an opening, and there's the greater omentum. And so you see it arising from the bottom or greater curvature of the stomach, and it descends down. And then it makes an apron. It kind of loops back up and ascends up and attaches all along the transverse colon. So let's do that again, except in this sagittal cartoon, where the stomach is shown by the letter S, and then TC stands for transverse colon. Um, and there we have the greater omentum arising from the a bottom of the stomach and it descends down and then loops and all the way up to the transverse colon. Makes this really big apron-like structure. So small intestines, that includes the following components. There's duodenum, there's jejunum, and there's ileum. So let's take a look at the duodenum first. And that duodenum has four parts. 
and they're called the first part, second part, third part, fourth part. Did you like that? Came with a lot. That's your tuition dollars at work there. So the first part also has another name because anatomists love to give more than one name to these thousands of structures. First part are superior, second part descending, third part transverse, fourth part ascending. So let's take a look at the first part. The first part um, is the part that uh, uh, is associated with the end of the stomach. So P stands for pylorus, and then there in green is the first part of the duodenum, also called the superior part because it's the highest area. To add her to insult, radiologists also call it duodenal cap or the duodenal bulb because if we look at this upper G, uh, barium GI study where it's an x-ray but they've had the patient swallow a barium and barium is a contrast which means it's dense and the x-rays don't go through it. So everything you see in white is actually barium within the lumen of your GI tract and that part of green is that first part of the duodenum. They call it duodenal bulb or cap because you see it makes like a cap on the top of the duodenum. Um, you know, a couple of parts about the first part of the duodenum is it's smooth walled. Take a look at the smoothness and the smoothness in contrast to the rugae that we see in the rest of the duodenum. It's also intraperitoneal where the rest of the second, third, and fourth parts of the duodenum are behind the uh, parietal peritoneum, which is considered retroperitoneal. Uh, it's also the first part is where duodenal ulcers occur, or primary place where they would occur. Now, the second part of the duodenum is this area outlined in green there. It's called the descending part because, as you see, after the superior part, it descends down. And it also is an area where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct uh, put their products into the duodenum. The bile duct is going to be for bile and to emulsify fat and pancreatic duct for digestive enzymes. Those two ducts, the bile and uh, pancreatic duct, come together and they enter into the second part of the duodenum in this thing called the dermal papilla or the ampulla of water. Um, that dark line represents a, a, a distinction between uh, foregut and midgut. So the foregut is this embryonic part that is supplied by the celiac trunk and the midgut supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, which we'll talk about later. Right after between the second and third parts of the duodenum is where that separation occurs. Now the third part of the duodenum is now distal to that. It's called transverse because you see that this part kind of goes in a horizontal or transverse section. I don't know if you can hear that, but my children are screaming upstairs and jumping up and down. Be good times. They might even come into this uh, audio in a few minutes. Probably be screaming though. Now the third part of the uh, duodenum has the superior mesenteric artery and superior mesenteric vein that traverse over top. So there we've got the superior mesenteric artery and there's a superior mesenteric vein. Veins always right, arteries always left in this. And that's one of the distinguishing features to this transverse part is the superior mesenteric artery and vein course over top. And now finally the fourth or ascending part as you can see that it goes up um, gives rise to or then will then give rise to the jejunum, the next part of the small intestine, and it's also where we have uh, this attachment called the ligament of trites that comes from the right crust of the diaphragm and attaches on right at that fourth part of the duodenum where it becomes the jejunum, and it's a, it's a distinguishing feature that surgeons look for to determine where the duodenum ends and the jejunum begins. Suspensory ligament of trites, sometimes called the uh, duodenal jejunal suspensory ligament. Now, the jejunum, the next part of the small intestine, is deep to the greater omentum. So let's take this greater omentum and go shing and reflect it up. Hey, look, there's all the small intestines that are there. And the jejunum is located primarily in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen. It starts at the ligament of trites and then stays in that upper right quadrant and Within this jejunum, there is numerous plicae circulari, or known as circular folds. And so if we were to op take a part and open it up, look at these circular folds. And their whole purpose is to increase surface area for absorption. So the duodenum has this, the pancreas dump these digestive enzymes that chemically break down carbohydrates to glucose, um, fats to fatty acids and glycerol, proteins to amino acids. And then they, these circular folds, or plicae circulari, increased surface area for this absorption of all those nutrients into the blood. So a lot of circular folds in the jejunum. Now the ileum is located primarily in the left right, lower, lower right quadrant, pardon me, lower right quadrant. 
and it um, you'll recognize that as you go along the small intestine there's fewer circular folds because there's less absorption that occurs because the majority of it happened more proximally in the small intestine. Now, another thing that separates the ileum in these small intestines are these little tiny things in illustration. I've rarely ever seen them grossly, but they're there microscopically, are these dense lymphoid uh, nodules called pyrus patches. It's an aggregation of uh, a lot of lymphatic tissue, and it's there to help fight infection, and primarily because you think the next part of the bowel is the colon, and the colon has a ton of bacteria, so to basically help make sure you don't infect yourself. Now, our large intestines has the following components, the cecum, ascending, transverse, descending colon, the sigmoid colon, rectum, and anus. So we're going to start with the cecum first, and the cecum is that first part. It's a blind-ended pouch, which is what cecum means. Um, at the bottom right quadrant of the abdomen. And so there we have the ileum that empties into the cecum, or the cecum receives contents of the ileum. Now, on the bottom of the cecum is another blind-ended pouch called the vermiform appendix, or just appendix. It's a vestigial structure or organ. It doesn't do much except store lymphatic waste, and um, if it gets inflamed, it's kind of a bummer. So. To find the appendix in surface anatomy, we find first the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS. We find the umbilicus, and we make an imaginary line between the two. In about a third of the way up, between the ASIS and the umbilicus, there's this imaginary point called McBurney's point. That is the su surface landmark of where the appendix and the cecum have their junction. Ascending colon is this part that ascends in the right part of the abdomen, and then uh, at the very top is something called the hepatic flexure because the liver is right above it, hepatic for liver. It's also called the right colic flexure, colic for colon. The transverse colon arises from the right colic flexure and courses over to the splenic flexure, where the spleen is located, also known as your left colic flexure, uh, colic for colon. Then we have our descending colon from the left colic flexure all the way down to the bottom of the left lower quadrant. You'll notice these little pouches that are called hostra. And these out pouches are formed by this longitudinal muscle called the tenae coli muscle. And these hostra give a very characteristic appearance to the large intestine. Our sigmoid colon gets its name because sigmoid for S. It makes this S-shaped pattern as it goes into the rectum. And this term rectum or rectus means straight. That straight shot down um, to the anus where the anal sphincters are. Internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle where you don't control. But as feces compacts down to the rectum, the smooth muscle relaxes. So the external anal sphincter, which is skeletal muscle, voluntary control, is the only thing that's stopping that feces from exiting because the next pathway in this is uh, the toilet. That's next. And there is our GI tract in an overview.